Yeah, come on, that's lobby. <laughs> lobby for your lobby gobblers. Here. <laughs> Morgan. Today's short video is going to take us to... Well, we're in the vicinity of three ancient monuments from three different eras, three very different eras. And I'm certainly no expert on the first two eras. Here we are, this is Thirlwall Castle. How did it get its name? Thirl means hole, wall is Hadrian's Wall. It's Hole in the Wall Castle, Thirlwall Castle. And it was built round about the year 1330, in the mid-1330s, by a guy that became known as John Thirlwall and was situated obviously in Northumberland, next to the River Tipholt, uh, on our way to Gilsland, but near the mining settlement of Longbyre. Now besides Thirlwall Castle, obviously, we've got the wall that comes through. <laughs> and if you want to see the remains of the Roman wall here, look no further, because that's what went to build the castle. But what we've come to look at, actually, is a a monument from a, another time period, an industrial age that's still standing and still just as important as far as I'm concerned. And that is just about a mile to our north there. But of course the castle wasn't here to defend against Romans, was it? It was here to defend against the Scots, or particularly the border reavers, because this is reaving country, where parties from both England and then parties from Scotland would raid each other, and that's where you get your term bereaved. So this was an essential stronghold, really, and it prospered, or it kept going anyway. I think it was Lionel Thirlwall who had it until he died in the, in the 1500s. But by the 1600s and the Union of England and Scotland, obviously, to an extent, those raids stopped. To what extent they stopped, did they carry on? I'm not an expert in border reaving. But the, the castle, slowly fell into disuse until it was bought, or the whole estate was really bought, by Lord Carlisle in, um, I think it was 1748, thereabouts, and he bought it for £4,000. And under it, there's a lot of mineral rights. Well, mineral rights, obviously, but under it is mineral. Under it is coal, Winston, uh, and all sorts of other stone, but it's a coal we're interested in, isn't it? I left my window cleaning stuff in the van, what a mess. Have it. We've actually got a real thirl wall here. 
Meet Anthony Thurwall. You're on a pilgrimage, Anthony, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Yes, it's my second time here. First time by bicycle. Yeah. And uh, the weather's a bit better today. It's lovely today, apart from the wind. Yeah. <laughs> so you're from down south, though. Uh, the, the family, half the family, moves from South Shields down to London, South London, and then I moved to the west of England uh, for an education. Right. And you're. Coming to get hold of the family seat. Yes, <laughs> take hold of uh, all that I possess. Yeah, why not? Like my life, it's in ruins. <laughs> anyway, lovely to meet you, Anthony, yeah, and you have a safe you, journey back. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And we're going to go on now and have a look at the monument from the industrial age. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very fortuitous running into Anthony, Anthony Thurwall there. Now, I'm doing my best to keep this out of the wind. I can't help it. It's a gorgeous evening, but this wind is hellish. But where we're at now, we're on the Paranouse estate. We're actually on the road up to Paranouse Farm from the railway. And this used to be the old wagonway. Yeah, the road was here, but also there was a wagonway when Lord Carlisle opened up Paranouse Colliery up there. Uh, now we're going to come back with Nick and Heb and do a more detailed survey, especially when there's no wind. I'll show you where the stairs was, if I can find a sheltered spot. And we're going to have a look at this other ancient monument. So they'd driven Baron House Colliery really when they lost the Blenkinsop lease to try and keep all the trade in the area. But their workings must go back a lot further than that. Um, now there is reports that they found cinders, like Roman remains if you will, around Thurwall Castle. So they put a drift in up to the Thurwall Coal right on the top there. Uh, is it in White Sight behind Baron House Farm? Well the wagonway ran from this point, this is where the stairs would be, although there's there's no left of it and then the later sidings from the later Thurwall company were here because Baron House just ran into the early early 40s really 1840s and then they came back 1899 thereabouts I think it was Clarks that decided to put him for a lease uh, but we'll go into that further well this is where the sidings were now behind me you can see the building the other ancient monument and people for a while have said, well, that's part of the screening plant. But when you look on the maps, especially the, the 25 inch of the mile maps, and you see the layout of where the screening plant is, that building isn't on. What is on, on the 1920 survey, is a power station behind it. Now, they built a power station, and then obviously they've built that. Now, as I've gone through my notes, what I find is a little... Just a little paragraph that the Mickley Coal Company intended building a, a gas production plant for their electricity or with electric power. I'm not sure which way around it is and that's where I'm hoping people are going to help us. So we'll have a look at the plant, go from the screens. Obviously it's not the day for filming because of this, uh, this strong wind but hopefully we, can, we might find a bit of shelter up there. So it's an appeal for knowledge of, uh, and perhaps somebody knows where the Mickley Coal Company archive is. If it even does exist and someday we're bound to have some knowledge especially all those into industrial archaeology of uh, the gas plant and how it works so I'll have, I'll have a look on the screens where the screening plant was do a bit of filming there and hopefully we can get the camera out proper again up at the, uh, the gas plant the farmers did complain about um, water from the screens polluting the land but anyway this is inside the plant and it's on two stories and it's definitely in two distinct sections interestingly there's all these windows at the bottom if this is where the tramway ran through through the bottom it's a big area just for a tramway 
So, like I said, I'm appealing for help here. Somebody did send me the thesis, which is really interesting, about all about the history of gas making and town gas. But it's when it comes to a plant like this, I'd love to understand more. Half, and it seems totally different. A different setup, bigger arches, and some of the arches actually are made up. They've um, they bricked them up for a certain height. Why? You can certainly see. I'll point up the, the where the second story was up there. Actually, there's more. The, the stand, there's, there's holes in the wall for something further up than the floor level. And what has been behind over the arch. There's a massive window, or it looks like it's been a window, over the arch where the tramway was. And you see what I mean? It's almost like an old monastery, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's in keeping with the area, all the Roman remains and everything, and it's a fantastic piece of industrial archeology span that's still left here. If we could just see a blueprint of it and a plan and interpret it better. Anyway, we'll show you the back end. So can you see this bigger arch here? And now it's been actually bricked in just to leave the small doorway through. But you've got these two big ones at the side um, and same at the back. So it's totally different at the back here than the front. You've still got your two floors, but I'm wondering if there's been a if they've been able to take tubs from the tramway up to the top. I'll show you why I think that. You can see the remains of these RSJs through the wall, and I know this, is, this has been filled in quite a lot, hasn't it, you know, with the, with the muck over the years. But if we look back on the tramway, we can see what... Was this a, a bridge coming up onto the first floor here? Let's have a look. And you just see the remains of that there that's standing, and you can see where the tramways come across at the top. Well, then again, it could be something else. It may not, it may not be part of a, of a bridge. But certainly that level from the tramway would take us up to where these um, RSJs are cut off on the side of the wall here. station. Yeah, the power station there is on the 1920 map. That's just a quick look around. You see there's lots more to see. There's engine beds here. Is that a chimney behind us? The power station's off to that side. 
and there's a, an interesting hall on the other side as well. So I'll say just a quick look round. You've seen the um, the plant now. If anybody has any uh, information, any ideas how it worked, anything, however small, please let us know. And say me, Heb, and uh, Nick, we're going to come back and have a good look at the tram, the wagon, the old wagon way. Walk up the tramway and have a look at the pit proper as well, and do a proper video with that because we do have quite a bit of information about the pit. It was in several hands, <clears throat> pardon me, like I said, 1809, 1899 thereabouts. It was the Clarks and a consortium from Holt Whistle who were then already in business as the Featherstone who'd taken over the, co the old Cornwood colliery when the Cornwood Coal Company, Crow and Wilson packed in. They took on the Cornwood Coal Company and they also took on the old Lamley colliery and they, another branch of them, well, they set up another company as the Naworth Coal Company, but they came here as well. Uh, and opened up further up from where Thompson and Lord Carlisle had been, right on the top, and constructed a new tramway up down to the stairs here, which is just a little bit to the um, to the west of the, the old coal stairs. And again, they were working the, the third wall coal seam up there. And again, it didn't work out very well. They were sort of bust, more or less. When I say bust, in financial difficulties, and a new company took over in 1913. That didn't work out well, and the Mickley Coal Company came back, uh, took it on, and they were a good big company as far as I know, and they couldn't make it pay neither. It made heavy losses. It always did. The third wall coal, really, everybody seemed to struggle with it. Anyway, that train's signaling. Ta-ra. So thanks for watching this little video. We'll catch you next time.